Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, a warm welcome to our, our worship. We have any visitors worshipping with us this morning? Any visiting today? Any visitors? <laughs> yes, we have. Delighted to, delighted to have you here. Oh, another, some over here as well. I know them. I know them. Right. <laughs> There are quite a number of, uh, quite a number of, of notices um, in addition to those printed. So I'll try and take them in order. First of all, on Tuesday evening, it's the last of the Lenten services which are organised by the Warwick Alliance of Churches. And we've been moving around the churches during, during Lent, um, having services there. It was agreed that the last one would be here in, in Christchurch. And rather than following the theme of the Lenten services, it's actually to mark our forthcoming anniversary celebrations, the 300th anniversary. Obviously, that service is the 28th of this month, but because the other churches have got their own services that day, they won't be able to attend and participate. So instead, they're going to be coming here on, on Tuesday evening. Um, if the services to date are anything to go by, we're expecting quite a big congregation. So I'd hope there'll be a big congregation of our own members here to welcome them. Uh, and as you'll see, there are refreshments afterwards. So if you're able to help with uh, sweet and savoury finger foods, that would also be much, much appreciated. Um, quite a lot of food required. So that's on, that's on Tuesday evening. Uh, that's, that's at 7, that's at 7.30. Um, looking a bit further ahead for Holy Week, in the newsletter, the services uh, were to be at here on the Monday, Thursday evening and at St Andrews on the Friday. Last year, on our Thursday evening service at St Andrews, we were joined by Wesley Methodist Church. And Meredith Fraser, the locum there, was very keen to reciprocate before she leaves the Ireland, uh, which is going to be shortly. So we've moved things around a little bit. So rather than what is in the newsletter, um, the Monday, Thursday service will be in Wesley Methodist at 7 o'clock. It's in the notices there, Wesley Methodist at 7 o'clock, and then Good Friday will be here at, at 10 o'clock. So just, just note that, note that change. Right after Easter, we have our anniversary celebrations and you'll, you'll see there's a flyer in your orders of service today with all the events of, of that week. Um, the moderator, Susan Brown and her husband, arrive on the Monday evening and then on the Tuesday evening, uh, John Rankin, our governor, has very kindly offered a reception for the moderator and her husband, church leaders on the island, as well as representatives of the Jewish and Muslim community, but also extended an invitation to members of the congregation. There's going to be about 60 places available for members of the congregation. And so the, the plan is that next Sunday morning, you'll be invited to put, down, put your name down if you'd like to attend, and if there's more than 60, we'll ballot it. Um, this, is to give, this is to make sure that the 8 o'clock ones don't get an advantage by getting their names down first. <laughs> so, next Sunday, both at 8 o'clock and 11 o'clock, if you'd like to go to the reception at Government House, which as you'll see there is 6 to 7.30 on the Tuesday evening, just add your names, and should there be more, then some will have to sadly get balloted out. Um, so that's, that's the, the anniversary celebrations. What else have I got here? The newsletter. This is the last day for collecting the newsletter in the Thorburn Hall. Right? Otherwise it gets posted out. So if you're able to collect it, please collect it in the Thorburn Hall at the close of worship. Ed will be there to, to see to that. I think that's all that I needed to say. John Burnett's got a few words for us. Where's John? Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. I wish to correct an error I made last week when I announced the dinner dance coming up on Friday the 26th of April. I mentioned that Oliver Grant, our organist, was a member of Working Title. Oliver came to see me during the AGM last week and said, I left them five years ago. <laughs> so he will not be in Working Title on Friday the 26th, but the, the five-person band is absolutely sensational. So if you, I will be selling tickets after the service in the Thorburn Hall. Tickets are $85 each. Already seven tables are booked. 
we have tables of 10 and there's 12 tables of 10. So if you ain't got your tickets, see me after the service. <laughs> I think these are, I think and I hope these are all the, uh, all the notices. Our worship today opens with the Psalms, Psalm 84 and at hymn 52. You'll see that it's been in the, it was in the Scottish Psalter in 1929 and is one of the best known of the Psalms in the Church of Scotland. I discovered at 8 o'clock this morning it hasn't travelled well. So I'm hoping it'll have travelled a bit better at the 11 o'clock service and that you, some of you at least may know the, made the tune. But let us worship God and sing to his praise. The 84th Psalm, hymn 52. How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord of hosts to me. Hymn 52. <laughs> Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Let us pray. Almighty God, we gather this day, the beauty of this April day, to offer you our worship and our praise. We gather with your whole church. The church is this day of the Warwick Alliance, churches on the island, your church in the world. People of different nations, backgrounds and cultures but united in their desire to offer you worship and praise, to acknowledge you as creator and sustainer of all. We gather in this season of Lent, reflecting on Christ's journey from Galilee to Jerusalem, looking ahead to the acclamation that welcomed him there, an acclamation quickly to turn to rejection. We reflect on the passion, his suffering, at the hands of the nations 
of the religious authorities. We reflect too on the cost of discipleship, all that he invited and called on these first disciples to do, and all that he invites and calls us to do in our own place and time today. And we confess that at times we have been lacking in that discipleship, in the warmth of our love, in the strength of our faith and our commitment. And as such, we have been neglectful of the needs of others, both those in our midst and those far off. Instead, we have been motivated, moved by our own greed, selfishness, self-centeredness and ambitions. And as such, have caused hurt to you to others and indeed to ourselves. And so before you now, we ask forgiveness for the wrongs that we have done. Grant us, we pray, the, for the assurance of that forgiveness that we might be freed from the faults and the failings and the guilt of the past. Help us to discern your presence in our lives and in this, your world, through your Holy Spirit, seeking to guide us in the ways of truth and of life calling us at times to places where we would perhaps rather not go and to the help of people whom we would rather avoid. Help us in our discipleship and in our faith as part of your church. And this we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Right, it's school holidays, but we have some boys and girls with us today. So as you come down to the front, if there's any pasta or spaghetti to pick up on your way, Perhaps you can do that. Right, if anyone's got pasta, just hold it up and some of the children will come and collect it. There we are. It just goes over there. Over there, Crombie. Harris, over there. Put it over there. There we are. Put the pasta down over there. There we go. There we are. Okay. Right, Matthew. There we are. <coughs> Right. Oh, love you. Lovely to, lovely to see you all here today in this lovely, bright, sunny day. Got something for you to do today, apart from bringing the, apart from bringing this, the pasta and the pasta sausage forward. I want, uh, I want you to help me with something. I was just thinking earlier, if if people came past the, the church, saw the door open, and came in, they didn't know anything about our church, or didn't know anything about church at all. I wonder what they would think we actually, we actually do here. And they might have a look around and, and, and what would they see? They would see people, they would hear us singing, they might hear us talking to one another, saying prayers. They might wonder what else we do. They might look at the beautiful church, they'll look at the lovely stained glass windows. Look at the lovely windows, I wonder what, what they're about. But they might also be asking themselves, I wonder, I wonder what else they do. And you know, there's something that tells them that the moment they come in the door. If they come in the north door there, there's something that tells them something of what we do. Who'd like to go and have a look and try and find out for me? Who's going to go? Right, sir, you go to the door, have a look round, and see if there's anything you see there that tells us something about what we do as a church. What do you see? Have a look. It's inside. Have a look round. Let me come and help you. Let me come and help you. Let's have a look. As you come in, as you come in, you'd see the choir and the organ. We know it would sing. We'd see the people. But there's something just right here on the door as we come in, and it's this. And what does it say? For the poor. It says for the poor. It's for the poor. Let's go back down. As you come in church, the first thing that you would see is that box there for the poor. And that's something we're going to be thinking about today in our service. And that's why we bring spaghetti the first Sunday of the month to give to the Salvation Army. And they give it to people who probably don't have very much food and don't have food on the table. And giving to the poor is something that the church has always done. Churches have maybe changed over the years. They look different. They sing different hymns. There are different kinds of churches. But at the heart of every church should be something like that. Gifts, gifts to the poor. Because that, that never goes away. Sometimes things change. 
But I was back in Melrose, was a little village outside Melrose, where all the expensive houses were, right? These were the costly houses. And I was meant to be in charge of a charity which was for the poor of Gattonside, right? I found it very hard to find the poor in Gattonside, right? But there are always poor with us. And part of the job that the church does is to look out for them and to try and help them in any way. And that's one of the stories we're going to be looking at in church later on today. And that's something that Jesus taught us all to be kind, to look after those who are needy. And so we're going to sing this hymn now. Jesus' hands were kind hands, doing good to all. It's hymn 351. Stay standing for our blessing on the children. Loving God, as our children go from here, may they go with your blessing, knowing at all times in their lives, your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear the word of God, first as we find it in the Old Testament in the Psalms, and we'll be reading Psalm 8. We're going to read this responsively. There is an insert in the order of service with the words on it. Psalm 8. O Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Our next reading is from Revelations. Revelations 21, reading verses 1 to 5. This can be found in the Bibles in the pew in the New Testament section on page 259. Revelations 21, reading from verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God, 
and they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Today's Gospel is actually Matthew chapter 25, not 24, chapter 25, and at verse 31, it's page 29 in your Pew Bible's New Testament. Matthew chapter 25 and at verse 31, the judgment of the nations. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, Just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. May God bless to us the reading of his word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Amen. The hymn is hymn 238, 238. Lord, bring the day to pass when forest, rock, and hill, the beast, the bird, the grass will know your finished will. Hymn 238.
May the words of our mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'm fairly sure you're uh, familiar with the story of the, of the sheep and the goats. Traditionally, it's, it's read at the end of the, the Christian year. In other words, the last, the last Sunday before the beginning of, of Advent, the Sunday often known as the reign of Christ or Christ the King. And so it talks about the end of things, the, the, the end time and, the, and the, judgment of, the judgment of God. So that's its normal, that's its normal setting. Uh, but in some lecturers it's put here on this Sunday which is known as Passion Sunday. Uh, Passion Sunday and then next week Palm Sunday and then the great celebration of, of, of Easter. It's only found in Matthew's Gospel. It's not found in any of the other Gospels. And it's intriguing that Matthew in writing his Gospel puts it here right in this place. In a sense it's virtually at the end of Jesus' ministry and, and teaching because after we read the story of the of the sheep and the goats and turn the page we're immediately into much to the passion narrative and Jesus arrest and trial exe and execution so Matthew quite deliberately places it at, at, at this point in his gospel I think in some denominations more than others it, it, it causes difficulty I was listening to a commentary on it um, by a Lutheran pastor um, who said, well, whatever Matthew was, he wasn't a Lutheran. And, and that's fairly understandable. But what, what did he actually, what did he mean by that? Well, of course, Martin Luther, the great reformer, was, was constantly worried, ob obsessed almost, this, this Roman Catholic priest that, that, that he was, about the certainty, if you like, of his eternal salvation. I mean, had he done enough? You know, was he doing enough? Were the things he he had done that he shouldn't have done, but worse than that were the things he should have done that he hadn't done. Had he, had he done enough? And in his torment, really, he went back to the letters of St. Paul. And there, he sort of emphasized the teaching, which is very much part of, of, of the Lutheran church and also part of our own church, is the Reformed church, that it's not by what we do that we are therefore accepted by God, if you like. It's not through our good works that God accepts us and forgives us. It's, it's through God's grace um, and God's forgiving nature. And so the great tenet, if you like, of the Lutheran uh, faith or denomination would be justification by grace in faith. Justification by grace, not by works. This passage is difficult for them because it seems to, it seems to speak about, about works. It's what we do um, rather than what we what we believe and maybe the way around that is to understand that that in faith acknowledging the grace of God and his forgiveness in faith should in fact be a, a transformative experience it should make us different people and as different people we will respond to needs of others as is described in this in this story and if we haven't become different people then there's been something there's been something lacking uh, in our faith. We, we have not been transformed. We have gone on living the way we have, we have always lived and in so doing have perhaps neglected the poor, the naked, the needy, those in our, on our doorstep and those further, further afield. So I think for a Lutheran or even for a reform minister that's how you would place what seems to be a, a kind of you know, f salvation by works rather than faith. You'd understand it in that way. No, we, we acknowledge God's graciousness and forgiveness and his love for us and that should transform us as, as, as individuals. Why does Matthew put it here, just at this point, just before, the, just before the passion? Well, obviously in his whole ministry, he's been concerned for the, the poor, the needy, the neglected, those who are rejected within the society of his time. Uh, those who struggle the most. That has been concern for them. But in this passage, he doesn't just show a concern for them. He identifies with them. For as much as you do it to one of these, the least of my brothers and sisters, you do it to me. He absolutely identifies with them. And perhaps that's why Matthew's got it there, because what, what follows? What follows is Jesus' arrest his trial, his crucifixion. 
when I was in prison, you visited me or you didn't. And we can think of him imprisoned in the home of Caiaphas, the high priest. And where were the disciples? Where were they? When I was naked, naked on the cross, having been put there by the Roman soldiers, you clothed me or you didn't clothe me. When I was thirsty, remember his thirst and he's given a sponge soaked in vinegar. It's a complete identification with the most vulnerable in, in society. And so I say he goes on to, to talk about in as much as you did it for these, the least of my brethren, you did it, you did it for me. The presence of Christ in the needy and the poor and the naked and the vulnerable. It's interesting that in the history of the church, there's been great debate about the nature of the presence of Christ in the sacrament that we will share later on this morning. And the fruit of that debate, or the failure of the fruit of that debate, is a continuing division within the church, within the varying denominations. For the Roman Catholic Church, they talk about Christ's presence in the Mass in a very real and specific way. Historically, they will have taught that the bread and the wine are changed into the, the body and the, and the blood of Christ. They look the same, the appearance is the same, but their essence, if you like, their substance has changed into the body and the blood of Christ. It's their doctrine of transubstantiation. The Anglican Church takes a slightly different a different view. It talks about the, the real presence, but without the teaching that the body and blood actually become, the bread and wine actually become the body and blood of Christ, but nevertheless his presence being there. And in our own church, the Reformed Church, we deal with it in a more sort of symbolic way. We see the bread and the wine symbolizing the body and the, and the blood of Christ. But these differences of interpretation and understanding have resulted in a continuing division amongst the churches. If you attend a, a Roman Catholic service of worship, you will, I'm sure, be made very, very welcome. But strictly speaking, you should not go forward and take the Mass. In our own church, the Church of Scotland, we have what we call an open table. Anyone who wishes to respond in faith to Christ's invitation to the table is, is made welcome. And I sometimes think if more energy had been put into this story that we've read today, rather than into this debate about what is the presence of Christ in the sacrament, maybe we'd have moved on a little bit further. The presence of Christ, the real presence of Christ in the poor, the needy, the vulnerable, those who are naked, those who are in prison. Two things I just want to say in, in, in closing. It was suggested also to me in this commentary that that was the guiding principle of Mother Teresa of Calcutta, in that to all those that she and her sisters ministered, they saw before them the person of Christ. Yes, there's an identification, but there's a danger in that, because actually what we're invited to see before us in the needy is that individual person, to see them for who they are, to learn about them, to see what they've gone through, to see what their struggles have been, to see the real person. Yes, Christ is identified with them, but we respond to their need, not really because of Christ, but because of who they are and out of that need. But Jesus teaches that in doing that, in responding to that person in their need, you are in a sense also re responding to him. And the other thing I'd say about it is, it's not an occasional one-off thing. Um, I love the story of a, of a friend who took a, a Christmas dinner to one of our homeless here on the island um, who lives up in the woods up near the, the golf course and has done so for about 25 or 30 years. And this particular Christmas, he took to him a Christmas dinner, turkey, trimmings, all that goes with it. And the response he got was, you haven't any pudding, have you? I've had two of these already today. <laughs> okay, now, and maybe it just, maybe that just reflects that at different times, Christmas time, people think, I'll do something for for somebody else, a kind of, you know, a one-off thing. It's not a one-off thing. It's the very principle which sets or should set the agenda of the church.
It's as central as that. And that's why, as I said to the children, as you come in the door, the first thing, if you notice it on your left, is for the, for the poor. That sets the agenda for the church. And maybe the only final thing to, 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 to mention is, is this. Both groups in the story were surprised. Those who said, well, when did I do anything for you? And those who said, well, when did we see you? Both groups were surprised. And maybe there's a sense of in what we do and, and, and in our faith, it recommends to us a, a degree of, of humility, just to do things quietly but consistently. And in doing that, we do what it is that is called of us as the church. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm reliably informed that you don't know this next hymn and you don't know the tune and you'll struggle with it. But that didn't put me off. The, the words are, are very, very appropriate. The tune um, is, is by Orlando Gibbons and there's quite a number of hymns in the hymnary by Orlando Gibbons and they're all very similar. So my thinking was if you get to know one, you'll get to know most of them. Right. And the choir, the choir will, will help you with this, I'm sure. If you're really struggling with it, you can just reflect on the, on the words. But I'm sure by the second verse, you'll, you'll have got it. Hymn 254. O oh God, we bear the imprint of your face. 254.
looking at the expression on some of your faces, it's like giving children medicine. <laughs> it wasn't that bad, was it? No. Beautiful words, beautiful words in the hymn. Let us offer now our prayers of thanksgiving and our <coughs> prayers for others. Let us pray. Loving God, we indeed give thanks that we bear the imprint of your face. We do indeed give thanks that we share the image of your Son. We thank you for your presence in our lives, for your sustaining love, and your presence in a world in which there is much brokenness, in individual lives, in communities, and indeed in nations. And there in the midst of such brokenness, we find still today Christ through your Holy Spirit, identifying with those who are naked and hungry, with those who are persecuted, with all who are vulnerable. It is in his name now that we offer our prayers for others. We pray for those who have no food, in a world of plenty, in a world of rich resources, as we reflect on our inability to share these resources. We pray for those who go thirsty, for those who do not have access to clean drinking water for their children, and so where disease and illness is rife. We pray for those who are the victims of violence, a violence that so scars the beauty of your world and of all life. For those who have been the victims of terrorist activities or senseless violence, born out of rage and hatred. For those who are the victims of the legacies of the past and an inability of communities to overcome the barriers that, design, that divide. And for the millions that live as refugees, their country, their towns, their villages, their homes, torn apart by war and by bloodshed. The millions whose human dignity is denied each day. And in this season of Lent, and as we reflect upon the passion of Christ, we see his identification with those who suffer still and his presence in their midst. And the call to us to remember them in our prayers and to respond to them with our lives. We pray also for those whose needs that we know, we know them by name, and whatever that need, whether illness, or anxiety, those struggling with relationships, those who feel lonely despite being surrounded by others, those who have lost loved ones. We pray that they may all be touched by the healing power of your Holy Spirit and that they may be supported in their need by the friendship of others and the fellowship of your church. We pray this day for the leaders of the nations for those who govern us, that they may be inspired by this vision of your kingdom, that they may reflect on what is done within their own nation and beyond in concern for the poor and the most vulnerable, whether young children growing up or for those who have grown elderly and frail and are not afforded the dignity that they deserve. A welcome to those who are in need, a support for those who struggle. And so especially this day, we remember those in Mozambique, in Zimbabwe, in Malawi, victims of the recent cyclone, seeking to rebuild, but illness now spreading and disease. We remember and pray for them we pray too for our own families, wherever they may be this day, and ask for your blessing upon them. We pray for your church, for the life of this congregation, for those who have served in the past, for those who serve now, that we may be faithful disciples, 
for your church in the island and your church in the world, placed here to show how we might learn to live one with another. And always we remember those whose love we have known and who resides now in the communion of saints, those at peace in the safety of your keeping. May we never think them far from us, for we share a fellowship and a communion with them still through the mystery of that fellowship and communion that we have with you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We continue our worship with the giving of our offering. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your name we dedicate this, our offering and all our offerings of money, time and talents for the work of your church. May they be a symbol of our commitment to work for the signs and the growth of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray together now and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Before our closing hymn, I'm reminded that the Red Cross are currently having an appeal for the countries of Mozambique, um, Zimbabwe and Malawi, having had so much destruction from that cyclone. And can I also commend to you, on Saturday morning, Bermuda Overseas Mission, who are going to Malawi in July, uh, are having a car wash. It's in your orders of service. It's time, your cars, it's your car's time to shine. It's at the Warwick Esso gas station. It's $25, exterior only. You have to hoover out the inside yourselves, I'm afraid. But that's on Saturday for Bermuda Overseas Mission. Our closing hymn, hymn 543. Longing for light, we wait in darkness. Longing for truth, we turn to you. Hymn 543. <laughs>
Now go in peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day and always. Thank you.